Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church. My name is Brian Kiley, and I have the honor of being the minister here. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, multi-generational religious community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, including diversity of beliefs, from the divine believers to the humanists, from the pagans to the atheists and agnostics. We believe in the compassion of the human heart, the warmth of community, the pursuit of justice, and the search for meaning in our lives. We gather with gratitude this morning on traditional Cree lands that are now part of Treaty 6 and shared by many nations. A treaty is an inheritance, a relationship, and a responsibility. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. Well, you may have noticed that spring sprung this week, and so I've asked Ali Hammington to introduce the service with a salute to the four directions. Uh, could you all stand as you are willing and able, please, and turn to face the east, which will be this way. Hail, guardians of the watchtowers of the east, spirits of air, we invoke you and call you. Bring your gifts of warm breezes, green shoots, and fresh new life to guard the circle and to witness these rites. Hail and welcome. And if we could now turn to face the south. Hail, guardians of the watchtowers of the south, spirits of fire, we invoke you and call you. Bring your gifts of heat and passion, life-giving energy of the sun, to join this circle and to witness these rites. Hail and welcome. And turn to the west. Hail, guardians of the watchtowers of the west, spirits of water, we invoke you and call you. Bring your gifts of soothing and cleansing from gentle rains to raging seas to join this circle and to witness these rites. Hail and welcome. And turn once more to the north. Hail, guardians of the watchtowers of the north, spirits of earth, we invoke you and call you. Bring your gifts of strength, permanence, and steadfast resilience to join this circle and to witness these rites. Hail and welcome. Thank you, Allie. Our opening hymn this morning is number 163. I'm sorry you all had a chance to sit down. Hymn number 163, For the Earth Forever Turning. I invite you to rise and sing as you're willing or able. I'd like to invite Marcel Labossier and Lance Beswick to light our chalice today. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with God. 
I'd like to invite the children forward to light their chalice today. The youth are having a birthday celebration for two of their members, so they went, yeah, we're skipping this part. We're going straight to the party. Hi, I bet you're going to be the one who lights it. And our hymn for singing her out will be number 414. 414. Each Sunday, we take some time to acknowledge that um, stuff happens in our lives. Good stuff, bad stuff, uh, perplexing stuff. And we do this and recognize that we are joined together in community by inviting any and all who wish to do so to come forward and light a silent candle for whatever their particular joy or concern or perplexity of the day. If you'd like to take part in this ritual, please come up now. All of these joys, all these concerns remind us that we are tied together in human community and they're all important. And as you know, sometimes we do spoken candles, but most of the time we do silent. But today I'm going to break the rule slightly to note that the Crawford clan has a brand new baby with us today. So, like, how old? One week. What's the name? What's the name? Zachariah, born last Sunday, here with us today. So we are blessed with the new beginnings of human life. After a couple of memorials over the last couple of weeks, that's a nice thing. Hello there, my name is Andrew Mills, and I'm the uh, Canvas Chair. So I'm the person who comes to uh, raise the money that we need to make the church work. So I just want to remind you that uh, March is Canvas Month, and at the end of March, we require uh, all members to submit a pledge uh, or an indication of their giving intentions. So next week is the 31st, so next week will be the final day for uh, putting in a a pledge, putting in an indication of what you uh, intend to donate for this year. So I have a series of, uh, of things that we've written up that are on the Canvas website uh, that just talk about Canvas and how Canvas goes about. And so I'm just going to talk about the one that I have. Why give to UCE? Well, my story is my father was a chaplain in the Army, and he was a very generous donor. Uh, I believe he uh, he did give uh, 10%. I believe he tithed uh, both to the church that he was serving at the time and to other charitable uh, donation, uh, ch- charitable uh, events. Whenever he visited another church, though, I always thought this was interesting, he would always put $20 in their collection plate. He would very diligently pill, p- p- pick out a, uh, a donation envelope for the church he went, and he would put in uh, $20. And he went to a lot of other churches, so this was a significant amount. And so from that, I do the same thing. Every time I visit a church, and I sing with the Liederkranz German Choir, uh, especially at Christmas time, whenever I go to these other churches, I always pull out a donation envelope, and I always put money into these other churches as well. So I get newsletters from about 10 different churches. <laughs> it's quite, And some of them are in German. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I also give generously to this church. Uh, my wife and I, Karen, obviously, uh, together give generously. I, we also support the Unitarian Service Committee, the Food Bank. And it's, it's f- from our families. Our families were donors. Our families donated. And it seems today that uh, there's less examples of uh, charitable donation in families. And so it's not as common to to see people saying, oh, well, my parents gave, therefore I, I have to give as well. So I learned from my father that giving to charity and giving to churches was important. And 
when I was older, my dad would actually give me his tax return and say, here, Andrew, this is, this is, uh, I want you to look at this. I want you to learn from this and see um, not only how I handle the, 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 the finances in the house, but, but, you know, charitable donations and things like that. And he was giving very generously. Um, he never seemed to turn down a request for any donation, which I always thought was interesting. So I think my experience is a little different from others. And... Um, it's something that it's hard to say how we motivate people to give to this church, but I have figured something out. And that's that if you actually volunteer and spend time doing things for the church, you'll tend to support the church because that's where your interests lie. And so if you're not donating, volunteer for something. Come and do something in the church. Because those that volunteer will actually help us support the church. And, uh, and that's, if there's any message uh, that I can give in Canvas, is uh, we do appreciate everybody's donations of whatever level it is. But if you're not donating, start by doing something. Start by helping be an usher. Start by being a greeter. Start by helping with coffee. Whatever it takes. And once you start to get involved in this church and you see where the needs are, where the important places, where the money needs to go, I'm sure you'll donate to the work of the church. So our community is a self-governing and self-supporting organization. We receive uh, no money from uh, the denomination. In fact, we support our denomination. We send money to them. They don't send money to us. And so one of the privileges of that church is to... We also get to govern ourselves, so we also um, make choices about all the money that we spend. But in addition to supporting our own church, we also support other organizations, and we found that that we can give half of our um, unidentified contributions in our offering to outside organizations. And this month, we're supporting the International Council of Unitarian Universalists, and there is a a display in the lobby explaining who they are and what they do. So uh, as we take the offering, first of all, take the pledge form in your hymn book uh, that you were given in the way in, and if you haven't pledged, please fill that out. Uh, And secondly, um, please donate generously both to the work of this church and to support uh, the International Council of Unitarian Universalists. As we receive the offering, would you please join in the song in your order of service? Thank you. We thank you for your generosity. Now, words like donation often paralyze people with fear, and they're not intended to. They're intended to be invocations to generosity. Well, in the same way, there's another word I'm about to utter that also engenders fear and guilt and shame and all of those things. And this is not the way it's intended. When I say this this bitter, scary, terrifying word, this is really about spirituality. But the word is exercise. My friend Scott Alexander writes, Every day, almost without exception, I take an hour to tend my relationship with my oldest and most intimate friend, my body. Noon is my favorite time to lace up a pair of running shoes, do a little stretching and step outside, regardless of the weather, for a good swift run. And by the way, (laughs) it's really fast. This daily practice is almost always the most enjoyable part of my day. I love the expansive freedom of this time outdoors. As I run, I love noticing the pleasing intricacies and healing grace of both the natural and human worlds. Sunlight kissing a passing cloud, a cormorant gracefully diving for a fish, 
children recklessly playing in the sand. I love the experience of feeling so physically present and alive. And I love the feeling when I have finished, that glow of both accomplishment and invigoration that enables me to return to my day with my body refreshed, my mind reawakened, my soul rejuvenated. Exercise enables me to meet the duties and demands of my day, relaxed, focused, alert, patient, and eager. Now, everyone knows that regular vigorous exercise offers a wide constellation of health benefits, as well as a general enhancement of personal well-being and enjoyment of life. But what makes it a spiritual practice? Isn't that, pardon the pun, stretching it a bit? I think not. A spiritual practice is any regular, intentional activity that serves to significantly deepen the quality and content of your relationship with the miracle of life. For me, running is a spiritual practice that connects me in deep, satisfying, and enriching ways with myself, other people, my world, and the day. The spiritual aspects of exercise are twofold. First, exercise has meditative and reflective dimensions. Many who exercise regularly report that their physical discipline helps them to achieve a state of mindful and meditative peace and calm. And second, I believe that the regular practice of physical exercise is crucial for establishing an overall spiritual right relation with myself, my world, and the other human beings I share it with. As we prepare to enter into a time of meditation, I'd like to invite you to remain seated and sing hymn number 123, Spirit of Life. Ernesto Cardinal writes, The music of the spheres, a harmonious universe like a harp. Its rhythms are the equal repeated seasons, the beating of the heart. Day, night, the going and returning of migratory birds, the cycles of stars and corn the mimosa that unfolds by day and folds up again at night, rhythms of moon and tide, one single rhythm in planets, atoms, sea, and apples that ripen and fall and in the mind of Newton. Melody, accord, arpeggios, the harp of the universe, unity behind apparent multiplicity. This is the music. I invite you into a time of silence to enjoy the music of the spheres. Thirty years ago, our denomination published a spirituality curriculum for adults called On the Path. I led it a few times over the years. Essentially, it was an introduction to spiritual practices from around the religious world. We would spend a bit of time learning about it and talking, and then we would try a different practice each session for about 20 minutes or so. 
And finally, afterwards, we'd discuss our personal reactions to it. Did it work for us? Did it fit? What, what worked? What didn't work? What didn't suit us? So one week we could do silent meditation for 20 minutes. Another, we might spend time writing a prayer. We did some journaling, Tai Chi, Buddhist walking meditation, hands-on art exploration, and music appreciation. The main point was to illustrate that virtually any activity, especially one with some calming quality, some repetitiveness, can become a spiritual practice. And different things worked for different people. So my sharing of Scott's reading was, as I said, not something designed to make anyone feel guilty, but really to point out that anything can be a spiritual practice. Where one person loves quiet moments of contemplation, another might prefer to write, another will need some physical movement. And whatever practice is chosen has to fit the personality and the makeup, the spiritual makeup and the learning style of the individual. What makes it a spiritual exercise is intentionality and a commitment to keep on doing it and a willingness to let the action become a time of reflection. In 1999, a few years after the curriculum came out, I had a good fortune to have an essay accepted in Scott Alexander's book, Everyday Spiritual Practice, the one from which the reading came. His love of exercise brings him to a spiritual ex place, but it wouldn't work for a lot of other people. And it's an exact, excellent example of how spirituality doesn't, isn't one size fits all. His collection, for example, included 10 different essays on contemplation techniques, kinds of quiet activities many of us will quietly, traditionally associate with spirituality. But there was a section on activity and another one on nourishment. There was one on the spirituality of relationships, another on the spiritual benefits of social justice, right action, and finally a section on creativity. Almost anything you do that satisfies and lifts your spirit can become a spiritual practice. I chose to read Scott's piece on exercise today because it's close to my heart. Since writing it, my aging friend has switched to long-distance cycling, like me. There comes a point in life when running and aging knees just don't go together anymore. What he wrote spoke to me. I've never been able to do the prolonged Zen sitting silent meditation. I tried during an optional early morning class in the seminary, but I kept falling asleep. It was not meaningful, nor was it spiritual, but it was restful. Letting go of thought and letting everything not matter. Uh, yeah, that's not me. So my spiritual practice requires movement and action of some kind. And I mean that in two ways. My body needs to be moving, but there's something more. I find the experience richer when I am outside and moving through time and space as well. Exercise bikes, for example, don't give me the same release. My spiritual journey requires, well, a journey. First, I find that the repetitive activity quiets the part of me that I scientifically call my busy brain. On long rides, especially on highways, I settle into a rhythm that quiets everything inside me. There's a stillness that comes. The pedaling is almost hypnotic. My upper body is almost frozen without movement of any kind. And my mind gets free to wander to appreciate the beauty that I'm seeing, to contemplate problems and challenges as they pop up into my consciousness. I go to a place that's very free and very nourishing. My body might get tired, but my spirit arrives at the end refreshed. In 1984, I embarked on a 1,500 mile solo bicycle journey as I headed for seminary in Chicago for the first time. I suppose you could call it a pilgrimage, but actually what it was was a way of 
I was terrified of the thought of going to graduate school. I was never an A student, and, and graduate school scared the pants off me. So I figured this would be a good distraction until I actually got there. But I kept a journal on the way, and here's an excerpt from the first couple of days. This gently winding mountain highway was a safe haven. The fir forest came up to within 10 yards of the two-lane road, so it felt cozy and enclosed, like a safe cocoon of pine. It was a good way to begin my travels. I remember the utter silence of it compared to the rush of driving a car. Passing a lovely clearing on one side, I had a notion that with only one inch of rubber touching the ground, I was silently ruling through a scene without any sound at all, leaving no evidence of my passing. Even the deer a hundred yards away barely noticed me. In a few moments, it would be as if I had never been there. Sometimes I like feeling small in the world, anonymous and unnoticed. Like most, I seek meaning and purpose in my life, but I'm quite comfortable also holding on to the reality. I'm pretty much a nothing, a fruit fly here and gone in the blink of a celestial eye. And this does not make me feel sad. If anything, it puts my problems and fears into context. It's a relief, really, to realize that I am not, in fact, the center of the universe. We overuse the word humbling these days, as any sports fan can tell you, but it's comforting to think that the weight of the world is not always on my shoulders. End of the passage. So for me, the spiritual journey is best served by making physical travel as well, but that might not work for you. In a broad range of religious expressions, there is the tradition of pilgrimage. It's a physical and a spiritual journey designed uh, to a place of great significance in that tradition and is designed to engage your total concentration and maybe even be difficult, make you suffer a little bit. You have to work for it. The Reverend Fran Dearman, a long ago intern minister in this church, took a sabbatical leave to do the Christian-based Camino de Santiago, a thousand kilometer walk through France and Spain along an 1100 year old pilgrim trail culminating at the shrine of Santiago de Compostela, the supposed burial place of St. James. The largest pilgrimage, of course, is the one to Mecca, a journey expected of all Muslims at least once in their lives, but there are many others in different religious traditions around the world. And these are spiritual forms that place practitioners literally on the path, a physical and meditation and a reminder of the old cliche that it's the journey, not the destination. But of course, for most of us, this concept of spiritual journey is far more metaphorical. A person doing sitting meditation only travels in their mind. A yoga practitioner might only move a foot or two. A soul who engages in prayer stays grounded in body while their praise and their petitions soar into another realm. The key point of the journey metaphor is not about distance, it's about time. It's about taking time. Deepening our spirituality takes time and an amount of dedication. These days of constant change, instant gratification, and shifting attitude towards commitment, we've entered a society where we have a habit of not giving much time to any one thing at all. If it's not quickly satisfying, many of us just drop it. Devoting one's time to any endeavor is, for some, an increasingly quaint notion. Now, I'm not lamenting that or standing up here as the old guy preacher railing against the evils of societal change. That's not something I do. Besides, those of you who know me, that my attention span is as short as anybody else's. I have no aspersions to cast. But I'm noticing the change. And I'm standing back and wondering how the people who are growing up in this day and age are going to connect with the Spirit. I'm sure they will, because that impulse is deeply ingrained in our very humanity. 
that need to connect with something outside ourselves, something greater than ourselves. It is a basic human need. So I'm sure they're going to find their way. I just don't know how they're going to find it these days. Now, even though I am a minister by profession, I've never been much into traditional spiritual forms. I don't pray terribly often. I don't do yoga or, as you have already heard, sit quietly ever. I used to get anxious that I wasn't good at this spirituality thing as I watched my more pious colleagues. But about the time Scott's book came out, I realized that I was probably more spiritual than I thought. And probably each one of you is as well. I'd simply been building my definition of spirituality on old, traditional, structured forms that had been fed to me in my childhood. What is spirituality, after all, but a means and a manner for us to connect to something outside ourselves? Even if it's just lighting a candle every week. Scott writes, running connects me Indeed, satisfying and enriching ways with myself and other people, my world and the day. Some people call that connection God, but others will call it nature or love. Some people find their fulfillment in acts of compassion or in stirring up the imagination of young students or in playing music. Some scientists marvel at the construction of an atom or the universe, and they find their sense of connection there. And who is to say they are right or wrong? Like religious beliefs, spirituality is in the soul of the beholder. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes an amazing spiritual experience just walks up, smacks you upside the head and says, pay attention. I bet it's happened to every one of us. Maybe it's witnessing childbirth or holding the hand of a dying person. Maybe it's encountering a magnificent, unexpected vista at sunset or connecting with another person on a level we never imagined we could. And maybe it's the deep satisfaction you get from picking a perfect tomato that you have grown by yourself. Most of the time, these magnificent moments of connection are there. But how often are we too preoccupied and too self-contained to actually notice? How many sunsets have we ignored? How many tomatoes are just lunch? How many times have we hurried past an opportunity to be present to someone? Truly present. Don't beat yourself up about that. I don't. Everybody does it. We get distracted and preoccupied. We have things to do. We get closed off some of the time in our lives. That happens. Besides, if we were in spiritual rapture all the time, well, it would get stale and uninspiring, and the laundry would never get done. The great moments of spiritual awakening and connection need to be few and far between. That is the great power. But that said, I think there is value in training and preparing ourselves to be able to recognize those moments when they come our way, to be open to them. That's what spiritual practice is for. Going to church, journaling, praying, riding a bike, none of those things will ever guarantee a transcendent moment. Most often, in fact, those great spiritual uplifting moments will happen somewhere else out of the blue. But if you've participated in the spiritual practice, there's a lot more likelihood you're going to recognize it when it comes your way. You'll remember to stop and admire that sunset or that giant moon hanging in the sky or that connection with someone that you just almost walked past because you've opened yourself to a sensitivity and a sensibility that that possibility is there if you will only let it happen. We need to learn how to notice the gentle tap at the door instead of waiting to be banged over the head. The practice helps us savor those moments of connection, of enlightenment, and of awe when they come our way. But how you do that, that's up to you. So I want to invite you into a community question today. 
It's a very simple one. So for those of you who are visiting, we gather together in twos, threes, groups of 20, whatever you want to do, and take uh, three to five minutes or so just to talk to one another, say hi to someone you don't know, and answer a simple question, sharing the time. And the question today is, how do you feed your spirit? Very simple. How do you feed your spirit? Go. Go. On Friday, we held the memorial service for Jim Logan in this room. He was a member here for 45 years, did virtually every job in the congregation at one point or another, including he was president when I first came as a minister a long time ago. And one of the songs that he asked, he's a very good guy, he wrote his own memorial service for us, allowed us to say some things, but he picked all the hymns, and he wanted us to sing number 16, "'Tis a Gift to be Simple." I invite you to join in. The chalice light is extinguished, but as always, its light lives on in the minds, the souls, the hearts of each one of you. So carry it with you when you leave this place and share it with those you know, with those you love, and most especially with those you've yet to meet. It's our tradition to join hands and sing, carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again.